welcome to Like It Is. This edition will focus on the government's surveillance of Malcolm X. We'll also have an interview with two men who spent a lot of time at Malcolm's side as he attempted to elude assassination. We'll hear that harrowing story and more right after these words. The last 15 months of Malcolm X's life were momentous, a time of tremendous personal development and a time when opposing forces converged against him. Up until November of 1963, he had been Elijah Muhammad's first lieutenant in the Nation of Islam, or the Black Muslims as they were also known. The Muslims were closely watched by government agencies, and Malcolm was a prime surveillance target. Attempts were made to divide this group by infiltrating their ranks and playing one human failing against the other. Now I have here several pounds of FBI files on Malcolm X alone that support what we say and much, much more. See? Let's take a look at one of these documents. The document is entitled, The Rift Widens Between Elijah Muhammad and His Principal Lieutenant Malcolm X Little. Part of it reads, Little has attempted to develop sympathy and backing for his position, feels that Elijah Muhammad is in his declining years, would not hesitate one moment to take over the leadership of the nation of Islam. While Muhammad may be getting older, he is far from ready to hand over the reins. The memo concludes with a statement that reads, the attached memo or memorandum could possibly widen the rift between Muhammad and Little and possibly result in Little's expulsion from the nation of Islam. Now, these memos were circulated by the FBI during the period when Malcolm had been silenced for 90 days by Elijah for his comments about President Kennedy's assassination in November of 1963. Interestingly, during this same period of silence, the FBI paid a visit to Malcolm's home in Queens and made some fascinating overtures. Now, it just so happens that Malcolm had installed a hidden microphone in his living room and had taped the conversation. And fortuitously, I acquired that recording. One of his aides, Earl Grant, explained how that hidden microphone came to be. I got him in the habit of recording everything. I even had a little portable tape recorder. Uh, he used to carry around with me, and so I got all those tapes. And so I told him he should have one at his house. But you never know who's going to come by, even start taping his telephone calls, you know, so he'd have a record of everything. And so he, we had a very high-quality machine. It was under his couch, and uh, had a little uh, switch he could click it on. And so that was set up for that kind of eventuality. Mm -hmm. If you ever got any visitors for any kind of reason that, that he wanted a record of what was said, they'd never know he was taping them. Morning, how do you do? With the FBI. You have a couple minutes? Like to talk in? No, a couple of minutes. Thank your you. name is uh, Beckwith. Beckwith. Right. And your name is Fulton. Fulton. Right. From which, uh, New York. New York. There's only, uh, there's only one. Only one here. Is probably what you uh, assumed we, we came for to obtain any information you want to give us about the Muslims. Uh, I don't assume anything. No. <laughs> that, that's a very general statement on my mm -hmm. part, but uh, as you know, uh, we follow the activities of the Muslims as best we can, but we're always looking for new avenues of information, and who better than, uh, you know, than the head of the Muslims? Uh, at least up to a, a month ago or something like that. We're wondering uh, how's your suspension status? Uh, no one there? knows but Mr. Muhammad. You have to ask him. You're still in the, in the status of now. Uh, I mean, you're, you're, not, you're, still, out, you're not working now uh, or teaching now at all. Uh, well, I'm still under the suspension. That's what I meant. That's, yeah. That's a temporary thing. Uh, as as That's the, he's the he's the only one who can give out any information. Yeah. I wouldn't I couldn't yeah. say anything beyond what he has said. Yeah, and no, I, I think I think he has said that, that it's a temporary suspension. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the I'll, I'll be frank with you one of the one of the reasons we this we picked this particular time to uh, contact you is because of this suspension. 
the suspension was brought about by my own doing. Yeah, exactly. But uh, who knows what was in your mind when you did receive the suspension. In other words, bitterness could have entered into it. It would not be illogical for someone to have spent so many years doing something that be then be suspended. No, it should make him stronger because it makes yeah. him realize that uh, uh, law applies to the law enforcer as well as those who are under the enforcement of the enforcer. Well, you've taken nearly a perfect attitude uh, toward the thing, which uh, is uh, almost uh, unhuman, really. Uh, I mean, you've, you've taken the attitude that Mr. Muhammad wants everyone to take a be chastised, That's and, which is fine. I mean, <laughs> more power to you. But you see, from our viewpoint, that there's uh, at least a chance, and this has happened with other members of the organization. They're suspended for some reason or other, and we talk to them, and they uh, stand people up there, you know, and they're of course cooperative. Why? Because they're bitter. Uh, now, assuming uh, you resume your uh, duties, uh, we would be, as you sure know, interested in having you help us out. Help you out to do what? We are, we're always helping out the government. We're clean, cleaning up all of the uh, crime <laughs> that... Uh, fine, fine, fine. We, we, we help it out more than it helps itself. We're at least able to reform the people who have been made criminal by this society, That's right. by the corruption of this society. And any way to help it out other than that, I wouldn't even know how to begin. Well, what we're interested in, uh, basically, are the people who belong, the names, the members. My telephone number is OL16320. Uh, okay. OL one six three two zero. Now, uh, by this by this suggestion, that's I like telling you the sun shines in the east from the east. Well, no comment. <laughs> and uh, the teachings, uh, the plans, the programs. Uh, no teaching is more public than ours, <laughs> and I don't think you find anybody more blunt in stating it publicly than we do. No, exactly. I don't think you can go anywhere on this earth and find anybody who expresses their views on matters more candidly than we do. Uh, I can only agree with you. I mean, <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah, you're right. You do. That, the main thing is uh, there is a certain area of responsibility. This is because getting into our uh, angle of it. What we really want is are the names of all those who belong, the names, who they are, the identification. I don't even know them. Uh, you have, you keep no records? I'm not, it's not my job. I'm just a preacher. Yeah, but somebody out there keeps the record. I don't know who. I don't have any knowledge of those kind of things. With all these other responsibilities I've had, it would be difficult for me to worry about names. Plus, yeah. you would insult my intelligence asking me for them. You, you, in fact, no, you would insult your own because uh, it would mean that your own intelligence isn't heavy enough to weigh me and know in advance what I'm going to say when you ask that question. Well, without getting into an argument on semantics there, you don't know until you ask. That's not uh, semantics. Uh, uh, that again goes into your psychology. We've had people that, uh, not this group in particular, other groups, Oh, yes. Who have been just as vociferous against what we're ever we're investigating as a communist. Make that make a good uh, mm -hmm. case out of it. Communists for 20 years, you know, they hate everything. Uh, go interview them. Yeah, eh, they don't want to. Go anyway. So you go out and knock on the door and go, Where have you been? Oh, I want to tell you something. You mm -hmm. never know that you ask. And that's happened so many times. Um, sometimes uh, you where it isn't convinced, but sometimes you, uh, money brings out uh, the information. Uh, I have no uh, intent to insult you here. According to Dylan, uh, what's his name, the Secretary of Treasury, this, yeah. the money, this government's money is in such trouble 
until you can still spend it. <laughs> still, according to uh, your government economists, the dollar itself is in such trouble. A person would be a fool to sell his soul for one of these decreasing dollars. Oh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. You'd be a fool to sell your soul if the dollar was increasing. Uh, but this has nothing to do with selling your soul. I mean, if you look at it that way, okay. Yeah, but depends on how you look at it. Sure. You, you know? insult my intelligence when they, and not only they insult me, period, if they think I would tell them anything. But uh, it, 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 would, uh, it would be good, and I think uh, in, in many ways it might, uh, might be of some benefit to your organization, you know, if, yes. if in fact we can eliminate people. There's no government agency that can ever expect any information out of me that's in any way detrimental to any religious group or black group for that matter in this country no government agency that's fine. because they should use that same energy to go and find who bombed that church down there in Alabama well, and if they if the government if these government agencies spend as much money and time and energy you know what somebody in the south is saying today Few people would go up north and investigate the Muslims with the same energy you're trying to find this bomb the here. The Muslims don't <laughs> bomb churches. I know. I know they, they say that. But still, the Muslims don't right. bomb churches. No, if we broke laws, they'd have us in jail tomorrow. Now, that obviously is an audio recording. We didn't have picture uh, available of that interview, so we had to supply some artistic renderings that were done by our graphics artist, Delambe Brass. And also we supplied some photographs, interwove some photographs into that, uh, supplied to us by Robert L. Haggins. Now, it just so happens that we have the FBI report uh, that on that interview, the agent's report of that February 4, 1964 interview that you just heard. And that report to the head office says, the New York office does not contemplate any additional contact with Little at this time, as there appears to be no benefit to be derived therefrom. Now, despite the turndown, the FBI continued, undaunted, in their constant surveillance of Malcolm and the growing animosity towards him on the part of some members of the black Muslims. By the middle of 1964, the FBI was issuing memos like this, showing their full awareness that Malcolm's life was in serious jeopardy. Quote, in view of recent threats against subject, apparently by Nation of Islam members, the Bureau has requested that local police be advised whenever subject is in their city. Practically every move Malcolm made was being noted by the FBI. Another, subject will definitely not be in Chicago this date since he is going to Boston and will later be in Washington, D.C. on 6-26-64 latter two offices advised. And still another memo. Omaha and Chicago should alert police in their cities as to subjects proposed trips. Also re remain alert for any incidents between subject and the Nation of Islam. And when he went to Africa later that summer, the FBI received reports of Malcolm's activities over there. This memo re reports, quote, Alexandria, Egypt. Malcolm addressed over 800 Muslim students representing 73 African and Asian countries, unquote. We think it important to note the vast sums of American taxpayers' monies that were spent to keep a man under surveillance who was merely fighting for justice for his people. Moreover, there seems a clear question about such intense scrutiny of a man's activities, while at the same time, there was such an apparent inability to protect him. There was, however, a small group of men who were loyal to Malcolm, and they valiantly tried to protect his life. We'll hear their story in just a moment. Earl Grant and Robert Haggins both spent a lot of time with Malcolm during those perilous last days of his life. Robert Haggins was a newspaper photographer at the time he met Malcolm, assigned to cover the Muslims, an assignment he really didn't want. I had covered a lot of religious organizations and uh, subcultures and so-called cults and religion in Harlem 
uh, the holy rollers, uh, churches over Christ, under Christ, in Christ, on top of Christ, and then the black Jews, and uh, then we had a group called the Dumbala Whalens, the Buddhists, and uh, crucifying chickens and animals and all kinds of gods that only appear when you've been under the influence of having consumed uh, large amounts of alcohol. So I was fed up, and uh, I tried to give the assignment to some of the other you photographers. You thought this was just another cult? Another cult. A man, a grown man calling himself X, didn't know his own last name. So uh, that turned me off. I, I figured it's this guy called himself Malcolm X, uh, you know, X meaning mystery. So I tried to sell the assignment. Another photographer would take the assignment and I would work in his place. I couldn't get anybody to take it, so I had to go out there. What was it about him that struck you? Well, for one thing, the discipline, the, uh, the fact that uh, everyone was organized and uh, the respect for each other and the way Malcolm addressed me, uh, sir, uh, yes sir, no sir, he, the immaculate uh, cleanliness, the restaurant, and uh, the whole demeanor of Malcolm as an individual. And then when Malcolm began to explain to me about his name, about why he called himself X, and the fact that he refused to carry the slave master's name, and uh, he went into a, a lecture on the word Negro, explaining to me that uh, most English words derive its meaning from Latin or Greek. And in Greek, the G in Negro became C, which meant that N-E-C-R-O means dead. Uh, necropolis, necro, necrophilia, necrosis, all of these terms relate to something dead, something without life. And then Malcolm looked at me and said, well, you know, don't, we, don't they call you a spook? You know, you Negroes are spooks. A walking dead man. So, you know, that day on the way home, I started thinking about this man and some of the things he talked about. And uh, I wanted to know more about Malcolm. I wanted to know more about the movement. And uh, that developed the fascination. Mm -hmm. Now, was, what was the extent of your relationship? Was it just that you were his photographer, or was it more involved than that? In the beginning, it was a photographic thing from the newspaper. Mm -hmm. and then I quit my job to work for Malcolm as his personal photographer. And the reason why, uh, at that time, Malcolm had an uncanny sense of the value of the media and the value of pictures. He knew that the media was creating him in terms of being a monster. All of those early photographs of Malcolm depicted him as some kind of monster, fists clenched and blazing eyes and teeth clenched, all this sort of thing. So he wanted me to make photographs of him as a human being. And it was during this process that we became friends and uh, my relationship changed. I no longer was an impartial journalist as a photographer. I began to take pictures and also to think in terms of what kind of contribution I could make to him. How make could, to him? Yes, how I could help him in his movement. Because I would go out sometimes and uh, meet with other members of, of various newspapers to find out how they felt about Malcolm, how they felt about Malcolm's movement. And uh, I would sit down with him uh, at a later date and explain to him how he was being depicted, how the public was seeing him. And in that way, I was able to help Malcolm, help Malcolm to understand how his image was coming over. Why, would you, why were you so concerned and obsessed with helping him? Well, <clears throat> I feel, as I do now, that uh, Malcolm was the only leader we had, as far as I'm concerned. I, uh, I listened to all of the other leaders at that time, and uh, they all were involved with some segment of being an integrationist. 
they all wanted to lead our people into a movement where they would become invisible. But Malcolm wasn't doing that. Malcolm was the only leader out there that taught black people to be proud of being black and not try to be something that you can never be. And to go a step further, uh, Malcolm thought that integration was ridiculous because, yes, uh, because a no minority group can bring about integration with the majority group. And so you quit a job yes. to go work for him. That's right. Now, as things got more and more dangerous, what, what thoughts ran through your mind? Did you ever feel as though you should jump ship because you knew that things were getting hot? Yes, there was times when I thought about that. And uh, I thought about uh, the danger, and I realized that uh, it was possible that I could get killed. And uh, I talked about that with my family. Mm -hmm. And uh, I talked about uh, the danger of sudden death, walking with Malcolm, taking pictures of Malcolm, because uh, I knew that if uh, a shotgun blast was coming at Malcolm and I was in the vicinity, I would probably get killed also. But uh, I had faced many dangerous assignments prior to Malcolm X. And uh, I was used to that. I just, I took my chances. You felt for some reason that it was worth it? Yes, I do. In what way? Well, the role that uh, Malcolm played in our society is something that uh, we will learn to appreciate as time goes on. Because uh, sooner or later, black people will have to realize that the things that Malcolm was saying is true. They were true then, and they're true now. You remember the Nation of Islam? Yeah. yeah. But what happened? Did you ultimately leave? Yeah, I left. Why? Because there was nothing for me to do. They really didn't have any program for, for black people that had a, a lot of skills. The only thing they had for you to do is sell newspapers, and anybody can go out and sell newspapers. <laughs> now, you don't go to school and learn all these things and end up peddling newspapers. What kind, of skills, that. what kind of skills did you have to offer? Well, photography, electronics, and uh, I'm a, a very good researcher. Mm -hmm. and I had some strange training in the service I used to tell Malcolm about. <laughs> so, yeah. even though you like Malcolm, you yeah. couldn't cut the organization, yeah. so you left. Yeah. And then after the split, what happened? Well, uh, oh, after the split, uh, I read about it in the newspaper. And as soon as I read it, I knew something crazy was going on. Because nobody stops betting on a winning team unless you've gone crazy. So when they put him out, I called him up the next day. And he was glad to hear from me. So he said uh, he'd like to see me. He had a lot to talk about. So he, I gave him my address, and he drove over to the house. And we spent the whole day talking about a lot of things that had gone on. And uh, uh, what the, how he found out about a lot of things that, and uh, what he planned on doing, he was hoping he could just do the 90 days and then go back, even if he couldn't go back as a minister. He just wanted to be a member of it. But after the 90 days was up, uh, we realized that that was never going to take place, so we had to, we had to get going. We had a a world-renowned figure, and no organization, no mailbox, no nothing. So we were playing catch-up most of the time. And uh, we, we started holding meetings in various people's houses, and then we started uh, meeting in the Audubon, and then there were people who always claimed they wanted to be a part of it, but they couldn't deal with the, the discipline of the religion. So that's what the OAAU was set up for, give them something to do and and some people came in a lot of good people came in and uh, they did some very good work and then when did the heat really become intense after he gave the speech down at the militant labor forum 
See, if you go around calling white people the devil, they don't, they don't mind that. They put you on television, let you come around the college campuses and pay your honorariums. But when he spoke down there, he explained what it meant to be head of the Senate Armed Services Committee, what it means to be head of the Senate Judiciary Committee, all those kind of how the government really functions, not the spookism, but how it really works. And when we came out of the building that night, we were standing there, me and him and Brother John, waiting for him to bring his car around. And I told him, I said, man, we're in trouble now. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you didn't stop talking nonsense and start explaining how it operates. You're not supposed to do that. Because most Americans don't know how this country operates. White or black, they don't have any idea how this country operates. What did he say? Well, he explained uh, how government agencies work, how they work in other countries. Now, I mean, what did he say about your remark? Oh. He said, well, uh, something to the effect that that's the kind of organization we're trying to develop where people really understand, that they have to understand things. And so his teachings were becoming less religious and more political and, and analytical. Mm -hmm. There was a definite shift away from the religious base. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then that's when you became aware, you all became aware that some people wanted to take his life. Right. Right. And then I guess your role with him started to change from a researcher and yeah. organizer yeah. to a bodyguard, huh? Just about, yeah. Yeah. Very close to it. How would you parcel that out in your work day? I mean, you had to work to, to yeah. feed yourself. Yeah, well, I worked, I had a night job. Mm -hmm. And so other brothers would be with him in the evenings, and I'd be with him and some other people during the daytime. And uh, how do they phrase it? You carried some heat with you. Well, Malcolm said, if you thought it was going to rain, you should have your raincoat with you. <laughs> you <laughs> and so everywhere he went, you were with him. And Not everywhere, but most of the places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you would sort of arrange oh, to we'd... meet at places oh, yeah. every morning. Right, right. And then you'd be with him for right. throughout the day. Yeah, we try to stay with him everywhere. Were you involved in a lot of those confrontations that we read about? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's one at Adam Clayton Powell's church. That's when he spoke to the Domestic Peace Corps, I think it was. And uh, when we were there, there was some commotion outside. We looked out, and there were a lot of the people there from, the, from Elijah Muhammad's group. And so the brothers were getting, they were getting kind of sort of, well, I guess getting warm under the column, so I talked to them, quiet them down. I said, as long as they just stand out there and, and look ignorant, let them stand out there and look ignorant. And uh, I told Malcolm they was out there, and he said, well, just keep your eye on them. And uh, when we left, we went up to 135th Street, and we would come, we crossed the street, and there was a, used to be a shoe shine stand there. And Bumpy Johnson was sitting up in there getting his shoe shine. And we come across, he looked out, he jumped down, ran out and grabbed Malcolm's hand. He said, hey, brother, he said, we've been reading about you here, you got some problems. He said, yeah, I kind of have some. He said, so Bumpy told him, he said, well, well, you know how to handle that, man. All you got to do is make a phone call, and that'll be taken care of. That's what he told him. We, me, and, me and Malcolm were standing there. I think Benjamin may have been there, been there I'm not sure. So we walked, they talked for a while about the old times. And we walked down a hundred and... 35th toward Lenox Avenue, I told Malcolm, I says, uh, you know what he meant, don't you? He said, yeah, I know what he meant. He said, I don't want black folks uh, killing black people. That was his, his, his attitude. And, and a lot of those people down there need to be told that the only reason some of them are still walking around is because Malcolm allowed them to keep walking around. Because there was another group of his old buddies from his running days out in the streets that came up to see him, came up to the the Teresa Hotel, as a matter of fact. And uh, I saw some of them about two weeks ago I was with them. And I keep in touch with them. And they came up and offered their services just for old times' sake. So they'd take care of it, you know. And Malcolm, he, wouldn't, he would never let that go on. And he always told us <clears throat> if we could defend ourselves and never attack them because he didn't want us to, because he felt responsible for all those brothers being down there. It was listening to him that brought him in there. So he didn't, even though they were ignorant. And you can see where it's at. This guy that's in prison now, what is it, 14, 15 years later, he's beginning to understand that he was manipulated. Well, even back in those days, we knew somebody was running a game on them.
what role did the police play in this uh, what, when all these people were after him all these attempts were made on his life where were the police well there was an attempt in Los Angeles I wasn't there but he told me about it that's when they had that high-speed chase and uh, there was no police around that, that I ever heard of the only time I ever saw the police do anything for Malcolm was in Philadelphia when we were down there and uh, we were in the hotel after the meeting and I think the police were downstairs these are all black police and I didn't see any white cops the police were downstairs at the door they were in Malcolm's hotel room they were outside they told me they were on both sides they had the rooms on both sides and the room upstairs over it so in Philadelphia uh, you saw good police support, although you're not sure whether it came from the police department or whether these police officers, who you say were black, mm. just took it upon themselves because yeah, they liked the man. Yeah. But anyhow, he was safe when he went to oh, Philly. Was, man, they had shotguns everywhere. Really? They were, yeah, they were not playing. But wherever else he went, there wasn't that kind of police concern or even anything near to it. Nothing. No way. But now, it was clear. Everybody knew that he was being hunted. Right including the police yeah i guess they can read and yet the police were not running interference no no way so what conclusions do you draw and what conclusions did he draw at the time that whoever it was was well like the thing in france he couldn't land there he knew that there's no way in the world the muslims could have arranged that the french government didn't take orders from muhammad you know, from nobody else for that matter so he knew it had to be somebody way up higher than the average run-of-the-mill person or even local police department. They couldn't have pulled off anything like that. And they're, well, I guess they're the same forces that got rid of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. He had Secret Service all around him, but that didn't protect him. You see? Who can get better protection than the president? One would have thought yeah, that. Yeah, one would have thought that. So if they could get him, we wasn't looking for any help from anybody. It's a tough world. It's a risky world. You have to take chances. Things belong to people who grab at them. You can't just sit back and, and wait for things to happen for you. The whole existence of black people in this country has been a struggle from day one. And what little progress we have made has been because somebody made it happen. It isn't because of the way we part our hair. That's not the reason we've done it. Somebody had to make it happen. And that's what Malcolm was trying to do. He's trying to make it happen. And you have, a, I even meet people now. I mean, Elijah's group. I see them all the time. They're in Harlem. <laughs> Who just now, well, I guess in the last few years, beginning to see what was really going on then. The trick they were caught up in. What kind of an attitude did Malcolm himself have? about all of these things that were going against him, even though all the man was trying to do was do right. What was his attitude like? Oh, well, we had started, so we had to continue. We couldn't turn back. Uh, we had to, uh, to go as far as we could with it. And then the next generation could take off from there. Once he knew that that was all she wrote. Oh, yeah. We, none of us were planning on dying of old age. I mean, we hadn't even thought about that. One of the reasons why insurance wasn't important to us and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you're living so fast, man, you don't have time to think about a lot of things. It's a fast life when people are hunting you all the time. You never know who's going to be after you next. So, what was his attitude toward police, the Bureau, at that time? Oh, I don't... I don't think we really ever discussed it. Well, we didn't. We didn't. It was just taken for granted, though, that they were not, not a source of protection. No. In that kind of situation, you look out for yourself the best you can. Is that why um, he went through such great lengths with both of you, I guess, to put down a record? You. Earl, you recorded a lot of his speeches. Yeah. And, and Bob, you were taking pictures. Yeah. 
because he wanted to leave as as good a record as possible of what he was about. That's right. In the little time that he had, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we knew that <clears throat> time was running out on us, and uh, especially uh, after the the uh, bombing of his house, but even before the bombing of his house. We used to be standing out there on 125th Street in front of Chock Full of Nuts, and Joseph, the captain from down there, used to come by in that old station wagon they had. He had Norman Butler sitting in the right seat right by him, and he'd point us out to him, oh. to Butler. And he'd come up there one day, and he's pointing us out. So I walked right over to him. I said, get a good look. He said, make sure you get a good look, and don't make no mistakes. And he starts smiling, and he drove off. And then another time, they came around in a car, we were coming out of the hotel with Malcolm. They pulled right up in front of the Teresa Hotel, and I walked right up to him, and I, he, said, he said something like, I said, I don't like him, brother. I just looked at him. I said, you make sure you get a good look at me. You just have to let people like that know that you scramble their eggs if you have to. Oh. What happened that day? Um, your your role normally at the Audubon was to record his speeches. Yeah. And so you were setting up that day? I'd already set it up. And what We happened? were set up before he got there. Mm -hmm. And when he got there, what did he do? Well, we stopped in the back and talked for a few minutes. He looked around. How'd he look? Haggard, worn, like he'd aged ten years in the last week. And he So we went on into the back of the behind the stage of the Audubon. He's sitting back there at a table. And there are four or five people back there with him. And we were talking about getting a start. And I kept telling him he didn't even have to make a speech. Let's get him out of there. But he wanted to make it anyway. And so Benjamin said he would open up. And he sent me out to, uh, to, yeah, to, to call Ralph Cooper. I was supposed to call Ralph Cooper. He was supposed to have been there. Supposed to be heading up some kind of fundraiser for Malcolm after his house was burned. And I told him, well, let somebody else go out and make a phone call. Man, I don't go around making phone calls. The women do that. But he insisted that I do it. And uh, he was just adamant about it. I had to go make the phone call. And when I went out, I was in the phone booth when I heard the first shot. And then there were some more shots. And then here come all these people just pouring out the door. And this guy later identified as hair, whatever his name is. He was he was running out, still had the gun in his hand, and a bunch of people were, were kicking him and knocking him until they finally knocked him down, and they were just, they were kicking him all in the face and chest and everything. And as I remember him, he looked like a zombie. His eyes were bulging, like he was either high on something or he'd been hypnotized, I don't know what was wrong with him, but he, he just looked like a zombie, and he never let out a sound. And they were about this kick his chest in and there was no outcry of pain or anything. He looked like a robot. What did you do? Well, after this mob kind of got out of the doorway, they had those big double doorways, I got into the room, into the main auditorium and people were everywhere. Some were laying on the, on the ground, on the floor, a couple of them were shot and I went past them, got up to the, uh, up to the stage and Malcolm was laying on his back and uh, Brother Lukeman was with him and and uh, some other people, they were opening up his chest, and I saw all those holes. I don't know if it's off. Was he still breathing? No. I don't think so. I mean, it was so hectic, I don't think so. My brother Lukeman was there with him. And then, uh, so I just got my camera out to get as many pictures as I could of everything. Because you always have a record of these kind of things. And then when, uh, after, I guess, it sounded, to me, it was like, 20 minutes or half an hour before the uh, the hospital people got in there from across the, the, the hospital. The Presbyterian was right across the street. And they wheeled him over there. And then they surrounded the place like it was Fort Knox. I don't know what the hell they think we were going to do. And they wouldn't let in ever in. We had to sneak Betty around the back of the place to get her in. And uh, I came back down. There was a sister. I'll never forget it. She was standing up in the middle of Broadway crying. And I ran out, Muriel, well, Muriel, she was one of the secretaries. And so I got with the brothers and I told them, uh, 
that it was all over and that everybody should go home and just remain quiet because they want to run down and blow everybody at the Muslim at the Muhammad's temple. I said, man, don't be ridiculous. They ain't going to do this. Mm -hmm. They could never organize anything like that. Uh, so they they all agreed with that and they went home. And the next day we went about from that day on to the funeral, uh, organizing the funeral, making sure it would be held and uh, getting the brothers who were going to be the pallbearers and all that. And there were bomb threats at the church, Reverend Charles' at his church. And we let it out that we didn't care what they said. We was going to hold Malcolm's funeral. Just didn't give a damn. We were going to hold it anyway. See, when you understand that everybody dies, that nobody lives forever, then people can't threaten you. You can only be threatened if you're dumb enough to think you can live forever. Then people can threaten you. When you know that everybody out there in the cemetery is dead, there ain't no live people out there, mm -hmm. that they're all dead, then people can't threaten you. You can look any man in the eye and tell them to go to hell. And that was our attitude. And we were going to hold this funeral. We didn't care what anybody thought, man. We're going to hold it anyway. So we, uh, we held the funeral and got him out to the cemetery, buried him, and that was it. But we kept the organization going as long as we could. Did you take part in that burial? Certainly, I was right there. Did you put scoops of earth on his... Uh, no, 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 I didn't get that close. I was watching everything as usual. Mm -hmm. And uh, What were nights like for you? in hmm? those days immediately after the assassination? Oh, man, I don't think I got a four hour sleep straight at no time during that week from the time he was, <coughs> as a matter of fact, from the time his house was bombed until we buried him. I never got a full night's sleep until after that was all over. And then uh, we had to uh, keep the organization going as best as we could. Wait a minute, things were hot now. Certainly. So what happened? Uh, Did you stay in town? Uh, no. I had some place to go and stay. You always have some place to go. If you, you should plan ahead in anything. You do have a contingency plan. So you did leave town? No, I didn't leave town. I was right here in New York City. Mm -hmm. I just had some place to be. I was, but didn't you ultimately go? Yeah, out? but before that, the night, say when he was shot that Sunday, Sunday night, you would never guess where I stayed. I stayed on Sutton Place. That's where I was. And that expensive bed, the chair in there cost $400. That's where I was. And then after that, somebody met me at the uh, Apollo Theater the night they had the fundraiser there. All the Ozzie and Sammy Davis came up that night, Sammy Davis Jr., and told me I should, that they had gotten word that I should take a vacation. And three days later, I was in Ghana. Why have both of you um, agreed? I've been after both of you men for a long time to get you in front of a camera to talk about this, this ugly chapter. What made you finally decide to talk? Well, I don't, I don't like to remember it because it were good times, but the way he died was a very painful part of my life. I don't like to remember it. Maybe it will inspire some of these young people to to learn about Malcolm, find out what he was trying to do, and to continue to struggle because that's, the pro in my view, that's the best thing they can do to help themselves in this mess over here to learn the, the strict discipline he had, the toughness of mind, and not to be taken off by all of the, the uh, negative attractiveness of this, of this society, the drugs, this noise that people call disco, and uh, all of the other uh, deceptions that you find in this country. It's, these kids have really got to, the ones that are still capable of doing it, really begin to turn themselves around and, and look inward for inner strength because there's nothing outside. Your strength comes from, from inside and it comes from understanding who you are and what you're about. Somebody might say, why would you focus so strong on this man? You know, was, was he the only hope, really? Well, Mal Is it possible that it, all of this hope could reside within one soul? 
Uh, my knowledge of the history of human beings is, is from time to time, rare people are born, like Genghis Khan, Gandhi. Uh, there are people that stand out in history, like Agnaton in ancient Egypt, and they seem to personify all of the hopes and aspirations of a whole nation of people. You see it, it appears in one human being. And when that person appears all around them, they have to support him because he can't do it alone. Like all of these people had to support Gandhi, or India would still be a colony. And they killed him too. And that's where you place Malcolm. Oh man, he was a historic figure. He was a holy man. That's one of the reasons he's not alive today, because he hadn't been so pure and kept us and a lot of other people that way. We probably could have kept him long. We could have kept him alive longer, maybe not forever. We could have done it. But we were never allowed to touch anybody, unless in defense. Other than that. And these other people I told you about that offered to assist him, he would not, not permit it. He was really a holy man. He was too clean to be kept alive in this country. Couldn't do it. How do you feel, Bob? I think Earl has echoed my sentiments. I think that uh, the reason why I've decided to come here now is because uh, it's time. You see, young black people out there are looking for leadership. They're looking for motivation, some kind of inspiration. And it's up to us to provide that for them, to let them know that... Uh, <clears throat> the only solution to the black problem is not to force yourself on somebody else. To stop begging and knocking at the door and chasing white people all over the globe. It's time to stop and reassess your own values as a human being. And to, <clears throat> to set proper goals, to learn organization, to learn research techniques. To, to look at organizations, to organize to solve your own problems. Is there some way in which, in understanding his life and death, it'll be of help to us today? Uh, what they have to understand, well, Americans, are, uh, people in this country in general, are, are known for not knowing very much about the past. They have to understand, especially this young generation, that... A lot of these people with their MBAs and their sports cars and their their uh, corporate vice presidencies, they have to know that they're not there just because of the way they wear their clothes or the way they part their hair. That somebody paved the way for them to get there and that they owe some debts and that they have a responsibility to history to do something else other than just check cashers every week. They have a role to play. They have a people to serve. And until they, and unless they do that, as George Santayana said, people who don't understand the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. And uh, there were a group of people in Europe a few years ago who thought they were just other Germans. They thought they were super Germans. Unfortunately for them, that wasn't so. And you've got a lot of people a lot of our younger people coming out of these schools and going into these corporations, they think they're just another corporate figure. Well, that's not so. No way. That's not so. They're only there because somebody paved the way, and, and like those kids down in the South, that church that was blown up, they were like preachers down there, were trying to get people to register to vote that were killed, Dr. King being killed, Medgarver's. All this younger generation need to have it burned into their brain how they got where they are, and that the road was not it was not easy, and that they are not in heaven. That's one of their main problems. They think they're in heaven now, but they're not. They're still here. They got a long ways to go. And if you there's this book entitled The Choice. There's an article in there where he talks about a study in 1970 by the U.S. Navy. What would be the attitude of white people in this country? if black folks were beginning to be systematically suppressed like the 
the uh, Jews in Germany, and the study pointed out that most white people wouldn't care. I mean, that's a horrifying thought for me. I mean, really, really disturbing that anybody would even think to, to conduct a study like that in this country is scary. But that was the, the conclusion of it. If they started rounding up black folks and started making them disappear from the city, most people wouldn't care. They wouldn't care. That's what the study said, that they wouldn't care. Do you anticipate running into anybody close to this caliber man in the rest of your life on no. this planet? No. It only happens once in a while. Like we had a Toussaint down there in Haiti. We had uh, some of the Santahinis over there in Ghana. We had a John Fitzgerald Kennedy. You look at Washington today and there's no replacement for him. These people only happen every now and then. And that's interesting. You had a young white man and a young black man who tried to make the kind of changes that this country needs. And they were both eliminated. Then you had the man of peace was eliminated. So that tells you that the people who run this show don't plan on making any changes anyway. You think there's a connection between those assassinations and the people who run this show, as you say? Absolutely. Do you regret your years with Malcolm? Not a single day. Not one second. None of the brothers do. It's the best thing ever happened to us. What was it about him that made you willing to lay down your life for him? Well, for one thing, he was honest. He never lied. If he ever said anything to you, you could, you could bet on it. And he was sincere in what he was trying to do. And, uh... Uh... I guess I really never thought about things like that. We didn't take time out to think about things like that. Mm -hmm. We had something to do, so we did it. With just a few of us, Luke, mother, myself, Brother John, Brother Ivory. What is it that that hurts you so when you talk about those days, Carl? Oh. It was a chance to really be somebody. This country doesn't allow black males to mature. It allows them to grow up physically, but not to mature mentally, intellectually, or spiritually. And Malcolm gave black men that chance in this country. 